Hello everyone, welcome to Fighting the Envelope podcast, where we push the envelope and fight the current. I am one half of the podcast, Brandon Williams, and the other half is... The amazingly good-looking Cameron Sprague. So, throughout the next upcoming seasons, Cameron and I hope to take you on an, on a voyage through our deeply rooted opinions while informing the masses of amazing bits of media such as music, film, literature, and whatever else tickles our fancy. But we're probably just going to stick to music because all that other stuff's pretty lame. We hope to have a comedic but informative time along the way of our voyage into this self-discovery. So, let's go ahead and start off and introduce this spe- specific podcast where Cameron and I discuss the issues of race in our modern society. How about since this is our debut podcast, we talk about our favorite debut albums? You know what, Cameron? That could also be a way we could go. So, without further ado, let's get it started in hot and let's get it started in here. <laughs> So, we each made a top 10 debut album list, and I kind of want to add a disclaimer before we get into it. Brandon goes in more of like an influential uh, debut album kind of way, ranking them from the most influential to the least, and I kind of just picked my favorite debut albums. Uh, it didn't really matter how they influenced the the music timeline you know a lot of my picks are pretty modern and you're an old man so a lot of your picks are are old yeah i i agree so just so we're not watch mojo we decided to just go ahead and kick the honorable mentions off uh right ahead just so we didn't we weren't like that channel on youtube that does lists that ranks them and then puts the honorable mentions before the first one yeah so cameron go ahead and say your honorable mentions well my first honorable mention is a is a um, maybe a, a controversial pick as a Gorillaz fan. I picked their self titled album, which is my personal favorite Gorillaz album. And a lot of people really do not like this album. They buy it because of Clint Eastwood, and that's the only song that they listen to on this album. But I actually love this album from start to finish. My next pick is the Beatles debut. It classic. Please please me. It wasn't quite good enough uh, to make my list. But it still had to just be mentioned briefly. My third is one of my favorite artists of all times, Chris Cornell, when he collabed with uh, Rage Against the Machines band and made Audio Slaves self-titled album. I guess they didn't really collab; they made their own band. But I, I, I really love this album, and I really miss Chris Cornell. He was he was an amazing artist, so rip on him. Were you about to say something? Yeah, rest in peace, Chris Cornell, one of the goats. <laughs> and then my fourth debut album is Clipping's debut album and I didn't put it on this list because I don't consider it their debut I consider Mid City their debut um so I'll probably bring it up during my sophomore album list uh not to spoil the next episode or anything yeah yeah don't want to don't want to do that or anything (laughs) so uh my four honorable mentions number one this is not this is the outlier of this whole list uh but I'll be honest with you Garth Brooks self-titled debut it it goes hard for a country album. I mean, it is a boppable country album. Boppable. <laughs> Number two is Straight Outta Compton's by Homies with Attitude. Uh, basically inspired every rap album that comes after it, especially on the West Coast. Uh, and it's influential in the fact that it brought so many guys together into one group. Uh, they just made a killer album with this one. The third one I have on this list is Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, a solid female debut rap rap and hip-hop album. Uh, it's like, I would say it's kind of like the female version of Nas' Illmatic, uh, but it has a lot to say. Um, and it is an hour, so it's not like a short amount of time, but I'd say in a short amount of time, an hour being short, she gets a lot said and done. Um, and then my fourth pick is, uh, another very surprising one that most people probably wouldn't have, but one of my personal favorites, uh, Vampire's Weekend self-titled debut. I think it's one of the best albums of the 2000s, uh, use of catchy lyrics, uh, guitar chords, and Afro beats make it to die for. Awesome. Well, let's get into the, the, the top 10 list. Do you want, do you want to start us off? I'll start us off. So, this one might be an album that it's either you know it or you don't know it It depends on how much you like hard rock punk and heavy metal or just metal this definitely is not heavy metal but the stooges self-titled debut which uh was released in 1969 uh the band consists of the amazing lead singer iggy pop ron ashton uh, on the lead lead guitar his brother scott ashton on the drums and david alexander on the bass 
Uh, it was produced by John Cale of the Velvet Underground. And, you know, while I think the Ramones might have the, like, punk ass- like the punk aesthetic when it comes to style, the Stooges, like, they have just the whole punk aesthetic. Like, whatever, like, a punk band should be, the Stooges are, and they introduce it amazingly in this debut album. I mean, you have real bops on here. You have 1969, I Want to Be Your Dog, We Will Fall, No Fun, all very solid songs. The album is number 10 on my list solely because I might appreciate Funhouse and Raw Power more, but this album definitely is not far behind those other two. Yeah, I know how close you were to throwing the Ramones debut on here. Um, when I gave this album a listen to, I think Raw was like the only word that came to mind. I was reading a couple reviews on it, which I don't normally do, but uh, I, I, I remember reading one review where it was saying like how the Stooges suck and they know they suck but they don't care because they're just having fun with this album and they're not like as tight or you know like as clean as other groups especially in 1969 when the the british invasion was still happening um kind of like dying out they were they were a lot more all over the place and they did really have like that raw punk aesthetic like you said Kind of like how Cameron and I have a raw punk aesthetic that you'll hear throughout the next upcoming seasons. Uh, yeah, and whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and tell the audience your number 10 pick. All right, I'm not much of an R&B listener, but my number 10 is Brown Sugar by D'Angelo. Uh, an easy pick from the 90s. Uh, D'Angelo just comes out of nowhere with this extremely well-produced uh, album, he takes kind of like the, the old R&B from like the, the 70s and 80s and puts on that 90s spin on it. He brought it up to date and made it cool again. And it, it's it's a really good album if you if you want to set the tone, you know, Brandon? You know, I after listening to this album, uh, it is it is an amazing album to listen to, especially probably one of the best in the 90s R&B um, category. I'm just surprised there wasn't another baby boom, like a mass baby boom, like after World War II, after listening to this album, because it'll get you in those feelings. Yeah. I mean, I think I think you've told me this before. You think it's like D'Angelo is one of the few artists that went like three for three. You know, he really like left a good legacy on his discography. Yeah. Well, I would personally say Voodoo uh, is my personal favorite of the three. I probably put Brown Sugar after that, and then The Black Messiah, but all three of the, these albums are definitely 10 out of 10 albums, so this it's a great way to start your list, in my opinion. Awesome. All right. So on to my number nine pick. Uh, we have Marky Moon by Television. So this was released in 1977, and uh, it becomes a part of this mid-'70s New York City punk explosion, uh, which also would feature artists like Blondie, The Ramones, Talking Heads, Patti Smith, even though I'm not the biggest fan of, but have mass respect for. But basically, they came out of um, that little genre of music. Uh, it's led by uh, Tom Verlaine, Richard Lloyd, Billy Fica, and Fred Smith. Uh, and honestly, in my opinion, it's also just one of the coolest guitar albums uh, of all time. You have amazing tracks such as Marky Moon, See No Evil, which is a very kick-ass introduction, Venus, Prove It, and Torn Curtain. And... In my opinion, the 1958 Fender Jazzmaster and 1961 Stratocaster duo proved to be one of the best in music history. It's kind of like, they go so well together, it's kind of like Brooks and Dunn, or Woody and Buzz, or Elizabeth and Darcy, or Cameron and Brandon. <laughs> I um, This is actually one of my, my more favorite picks of your list. Uh, I uh, felt like some of your other picks were not like basic, but I was kind of expecting them. But this one kind of threw me through a loop, and I really liked listening to uh, television. You kind of introduced me to them, and they're actually a really good group. And this album's a, a, an amazing debut. It, it, it's very uh, different for the, the time coming. It was it was a little bit more abstract, and uh, I, I actually really enjoyed it. It wasn't. It, it, it's not I, like it's not going to be one of my go tos, but it was a, it was a different listen, and I can appreciate that. Now on to my favorite um, choice from Cameron's list. <laughs> so to do a complete 180 from you know the the sensual R and B of D'Angelo, I picked Slipknot's debut uh, because I just really wanted an industrial sound on my my list. I absolutely 
love Slipknot. Slipknot is 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 crazy. I love the energy they bring. And you know, they came out in 1999 with this album. You know, they were really front runners of the the new metal uh, wave that 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 was a uh, rushing over into the the early 2000s with you know groups like Corn, Disturbed, System of a Down. But Slipknot, I feel like was more impactful and I feel like they've stayed a little bit more relevant longer than all of them not to say that the the the, the genre is you know still good you know it kind of it kind of burnt out but at the time you know this nine man group just coming out of Iowa just totally kicking butt and it was it was awesome I think but I know you don't you don't agree necessarily um yes uh in my opinion Swipknot sounds like a dying Scooby Doo and I I don't know how to put it any nicer like I listen to albums like <laughs> I just, like that is the vibe I get when I listen to the album it makes me just want to like drop kick an old lady like sometimes like, whoa 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 we don't talk about hurting old ladies on this podcast can <laughs> chill out so take yeah I was gonna say take that how you will with this album maybe that that's not <laughs> maybe that's a turn off for you. <laughs> I don't know. It's you and like two of our presidential candidates in 2020. They just love this album. I mean, when they were both trying to campaign in Iowa, they both had pretty special things to say about it. And I will go ahead and turn those clips on right now. Uh, this first one is coming from Donald Trump. I remember it so well. It was 1989, maybe 1979. I'm not sure. It was a very, very long time ago. My homies got together, was walking around, gone and kind of going about, and they were talking about this immaculate band named Slipknot, and I was like, guys, who is this band? And they showed me, and I was shell-shocked for the rest of my life. That, that is amazing. They, they had me so hyped that I got a PBR, shotgun that boy, in their honor. Uh, they, I, I, Iowa, you are a forgotten state, but not because of Iowa. You mean Slipknot. I definitely meant so. <laughs> they, Wait, you got you got Joe Biden's recording too, didn't, dude. Didn't yeah, you? Joe Biden. He, he has some stuff to say. Hello, Iowans. I, I I remember I was I was campaigning in Iowa and was talking about this Slipknot band, and I decided to go and give them a try. The group from Des Moines, Nebraska, or um, uh, 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 De, 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 De Moines, California. De, it's Michigan, Iowa. It's Iowa. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, De Des Moines, Michigan. Thank you, uh, audience member. And I was amazed at how well they blended African beats and Hispanic styles in this group of four. You mean nine? Yeah, this group of five members uh, consisting of the Dixie Chicks, Snoop Dogg, Taylor Swift, Brian Wilson, Ali and AJ, and Fred Durst. They just, they killed the jazz game. They They killed the jazz game. Man, that, that 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 was that was intense. I, I I didn't know they were such passionate fans of this band. Yeah, I know it's crazy when you think about it. Just I don't know. You, I don't know who. It's now it's hard to pick like a twenty twenty candidate just because they both love them so much. <laughs> All right, let's get on to number eight. So my number eight is "Licensed to Ill" by the uh, Beastie Boys. Uh, this is a trio. Uh, of three dudes, Ad Rock, MCA, and Mike D. What this trio does is they blend the old and the new world order with their mix of rap and hip hop. Um, there are countless songs that could be easily listened to when you listen to this album, which include Fight for Your Right, No Sleep Till Brooklyn, Paul Revere, Brass Monkey, Girls, Slow Ride, or really, you could pick any of them to listen to because they're all amazing. Uh, they have a lot of fun rap lyrics uh, going on with very strong instrumentals, they're, which are very unique to themselves. And if you heard a BC song, BC boy song, I can guarantee within five seconds you know who you're listening to. A funny thing about this album, I don't know if I've told you this story yet, but when I got my first car, I didn't have a aux cord, so I had to buy straight CDs. And I bought this album on a whim just because I was like, oh, Beastie Boys, I've heard about them before. I was like, I, 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 want, a di I want a diverse, you know, catalog of CDs in my car. And it honestly is one of the first albums that I could listen to start to finish without having to break. Um, they really kind of also started my love for like hip hop as a genre just because I think like you said, they're a mix of rock and hip hop. So... I was a big rock fan, you know, rock head. Oh, I only like rock. I don't like anything else that's not that. 
this was a really good gateway band for me to get into hip hop. And they're actually a little bit older than I originally thought they were. When I was first listening to them, I thought they sounded a little bit more like modern. Like I thought they were like late nineties, but they kind of were ahead of the curb in a weird way. Just like with, with, hip hop as a as a as a genre because you had like a lot of groups like Sugar Hill Gang, you know, like the the um what's the other Earth Wind and Fire. They were kinda coming out of that disco into the hip hop. Then you had Run DMC, which kinda sounds similar to the Beastie Boys. But I think Beastie Boys kinda took that punk style, almost almost the rebellious style that you'll see later in like gangster rap and all that. And really kinda made it their own. And I'll go a little bit more into it later because I had to show the BC Boys some love. They're a little bit higher up on my list just because I have a, a, a bigger connection with these guys. They're 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 one of my favorite groups of all time. There is not a BC Boys song that I, I do not like. Whoa, Cameron, spoiler, spoilers, calm down, man. Like, <laughs> they don't want that. Also, my big problem with everything you just said is you lost me after CD player. What what <laughs> what is a CD player? <laughs> <laughs> it's this thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I go to like family reunions and they're like, "Oh, you you don't know what that is. We had that back in our day. We had a telephone and you had to like ring it on a line." I'm like, "I'm I know what a telephone player is. Thank you." You know, for as aggravating as my last car was, I think that it really started my love for the Beastie Boys. So I kind of have to show it some, you know, appreciation in a weird way because it forced me to to buy CDs. Well, I don't think. Um, your next pick would have been very new car friendly or old car friendly. So <laughs> old car friendly, old yeah. car friendly. Um, so recently this year, I would say 2020 has been my most ambitious year when it comes to music. I've been really exploring lots of genres, wanting to find that new sound that I haven't heard of before. And it kind of brought me to this, like, you know, we're starting to see this wave of anti-pop. The, the, you know, you have Post Malone, which I'm not the biggest fan of. Then you have Billie Eilish. I'm actually a decent fan of Billie Eilish. Then if you dig a little bit deeper, you find the, the, the groups, you know, Death Grips, Clipping, TFS. Taylor Swift. No, not Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lana Del Rey. <laughs> and I'm so fortunate that you brought this duo to my attention. My number eight pick is 1,000 Gex by 100 Gex. I absolutely adore this album. It's a very short album. It's only like 25 minutes. And Laura Lay and Dylan Brady bring this crazy abstract sound with these goofy lyrics that me and my friends constantly quote at each other. You know, your arms look like cigarettes. I bet I could smoke you. Oh my goodness. One of my favorite disses I've ever heard. And you know... 2019 had a lot of really good albums. I think that that a lot of people overlook. This album was something that I, I I'm so happy you 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 brought to my attention. I have a few regrets in my life, <laughs> but uh, one regret that I live with uh, every day, every single day, it haunts me. And for sometimes there's hours where I just can't sleep because just the fact that I showed Cameron this band or this group, I mean, and he just. He ran off of them. He re he really did. I mean, this dude like is obsessed with this group. And every time we hang out, and I mean every single time, he's like, hey, we, we, should, we, should, we, should, we should listen to 100 Gats. And I'm just like, uh, you know what? I, I'm cool with 100 Gats. They're amazing, but not every time we hang out. They are the new face of music, but also – I just don't love it when you shove it down my throat. <laughs> he won't let me drive or have the ox anymore because I constantly play 100 Gex. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but this is also coming from a dude who put a hole in his wall because he got so hyped to listening to this song. It was actually uh, uh, two holes. Uh, don't tell my landlord. I, I go pretty hard to Money Machine. All right, uh, Envelope listeners, uh, don't tell his land landlord or he will get into a lot of trouble. But <laughs> Jesus Christ, two walls? <laughs> two, two, two holes. Two holes, two holes in the wall? I mean, bro? I guess they were two separate walls. Two <laughs> separate walls, two holes. <laughs> Despicable. I I would I would put a, a, a you know a caution on this album. It's not going to be for everybody, but for those that it is for, you're, you're going to be punching it. walls. Yeah, punching, punching walls. walls. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think my next one is a wall puncher. If I, <laughs> uh, my next one is a Led Zeppelin uh, self-titled uh, debut from 1969. So along with the uh, Beatles, um, the next best Fab Four is probably Led Zeppelin. Uh, the band includes Jimmy Page, who had just um, came from the Yardbirds, which, 
Side note, I will add, if you're into the British invasion type of sound, uh, then you will definitely love the Yardbirds. Um, then you have this, the greatest drummer of all time, John Bonham. Uh, the iconic lead singer, uh, Jimmy Plant, and one of the top five basses of all time for me, which is John Paul Jones. Good times, bad times, probably the number one or two um, best starting songs on my uh, list. I like in returns to like introductions to albums, it's probably one or two. Uh, you also have other amazing songs such as Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You, Days and Confused, Communication Breakdown, and I Can't Quit You Baby. The reason I might not have it in my top like three is because I if I had to pick a Led Zeppelin album, I'd probably pick Led Zeppelin 2, which I'm not going to spoil anything, but it may or may not be on my sophomore list. Uh, but Led Zeppelin 1, I don't think is very far behind. I mean, just the way it blends heavy metal, blues, hard rock, folk, and just all these genres together, it's, it's mind-blowing. It'll, <laughs> it'll blow your socks off. I think that I constantly overlook Led Zeppelin, not because I don't know how influential or how amazing they are, just because I feel like they're overplayed to a degree. They're they're constantly everywhere, and for good reason, but I have never really given them much of a chance just because I constantly hear them. So when I saw you pick this as your number seven, I kind of thought that you were just going with the crowd and just saying something, a crowd pleaser. I thought you were saying something that people would be like, oh, he likes Led Zeppelin. Good, I can relate. But when you started to explain it, I saw your appreciation for this band and for this album, and you're very knowledgeable on them, so I respect your opinion way more than, you know, like the the fans of Stairway to Heaven. Not that it's a bad song, but that is, you know, overhyped. Like, it is <coughs> overhyped. Um... But I think that this was a solid pick as your number seven. I definitely found a new appreciation for Led Zeppelin through you. So I uh, I appreciate this album and their debut as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so my number seven pick is 10 by Pearl Jam. Now, depending on who you ask, Pearl Jam is either the best or the worst grunge band. Um, I thought that Pearl Jam is kind of left out of the, the conversation a little bit more with the diehard grunge fans. I think that you constantly hear about Chris Cornell, Lane Stanley, and obviously Kurt Cobain. Eddie Vedder, he's brought up in conversation, but I don't think anyone takes him necessarily as serious just because he kind of put the, the, the new style of that mumbling, you know, over the articulate lyrics where you heard like with Creed and, and, and other groups, you know, groups that did not, that, that aren't nearly as good as Pearl Jam. But this album is one of my favorite albums. Another one of the very few albums that I can listen to from start to finish early on. It's very easy to listen to. And I was extremely surprised to hear that this album came out before all of the other really big grunge albums. This album came out in 91. And I thought that it came out like 94, 95 after, you know, like, Dirt, Super Unknown by Soundgarden, uh, and then the, the the greatest, air quotes, grunge album of all time. Fetty, Fetty Wap's uh, <laughs> debut album. <laughs> Never mind by Nirvana, of course, but it actually came out before all of those really big albums, and I think, uh, in a way, it probably influenced them, and it, it, it definitely brought in the crowd for the grunge movement. Just because it's a very, like I said, easy album to listen to. I mean, you have a lot of their their greatest songs on here. You have Even Flow, Alive, my one of my favorite songs of all time, Black, and then Jeremy. You have Oceans. You know, just a, a bunch of really relaxing, easy songs to listen to. To kind of cruise into what I'm about to say <laughs> uh, next, uh, when he when he does talk about how like relaxing this album is. Uh, picture this. You're driving down the highway in your car on a bright, sunshiny day, and Ten's playing. You're just, you're in a whole new level. You That's hear it. that, you hear that opening guitar, and you're like, oh yeah, you rev your engine, you just yeah, drive. Rev my engine, turn my um, sound all the way up, and just, I just keep driving. I don't even <laughs> go to my destination. I'm like, sorry, sorry, I'm late, sorry, I'm do, late, Grandpa. Do another loop. <laughs> Gotta do another loop, but Eddie Vedder, he is magnetizing, like, and he, yes, he is 
sometimes, sometimes hard to understand, but <laughs> the dude has range. Like his he, vocal yeah. range is insane for like a, like a dude. I it's mesmerizing. Um, to me, this album kind of has the case of um, the Orson Welles effect and how they have good work after this album, but kind of like Orson Welles, Citizen Kane, that's their magnum opus. I mean, it was it was an album that was hard to leave off of my list. Um, I know I didn't have it in my honorable mentions, but it probably would have been about 15 if I like actually sat down and did this list because it's, it's a great one. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to add, like kind of like how you said, I think that Pearl Jam's discography after this album is a little all over the place. You know, they have... They they have some highs and lows, but they never they peaked with this album. You could say it's almost like their blue album if you wanted to compare them to like Weezer, which I'm I'm actually kind of surprised neither of us mentioned Weezer on our albums. Not to not to you know we love Weezer. We do we we actually do really like Weezer, but we didn't include the blue album, which I thought was interesting. But anyways, I think this album was a was a was a a, a really good um, another good gateway album into to to you know rock and everything but uh speaking of gateways to rock (laughs) van halen self-titled debut um honestly i don't fit the type of person who probably listens to this album but it goes beautifully hard um and for me someone who dreads the 80s hard rock the 80s hard rock archetype um i just find this because it's like that very like it's like that very beginning sound. And most of the time with most genres, I love that very beginning sound. And luckily this didn't come out in 1980 or I probably would hate the album, but it came out in 1978. Um, yeah, I don't have a problem with Van Halen. I don't think you do either. It's just their fan base is awful. I mean, just, just awful. Um, and really the biggest aspect um, of that is just the – trailer park trash people who think that running with the devil is uh the best song on this album and that's <laughs> wrong it's wrong i no simple way to put it um you have david lee roth killer lead singer probably one of the best rock lead singers of all time eddie van halen easily top five ten greatest guitarist of all time uh, alex van halen very solid drummer and anthony or michael anthony uh very solid bassist but over running with the devil based on songs that i like off the album i'd probably put i probably put ain't talking about love their cover of the kinks he really got me jamie's crying and the guitar center's favorite song after stairway to heaven eruption and the last take i'm gonna i'm gonna take a really hot take here <laughs> van halen one is better than van halen two in 1984 and you can fight me you guys can fight me i don't care um I, I can't fight you because again this was another band that I, I was turned off by its fan base. I think that Jump is one of the most overplayed songs of all time and while it's not on this album, it is kind of like It could be. It it could be, yeah. It you would I mean like it it that's like that it, it's kinda of aggravating that that's one of the songs that defines Van Halen because it's not it's not a bad song, but it is overplayed. It does not really show it like at least eruption really shows you know how talented he was as a guitar player um it's it's a gateway song for most guitar players and for good reason even though it is it is also a little overplayed i wouldn't say that it's crammed down my throat quite as much as jump or uh um running with the devil and so when you said you were going to pick this like i said similar to led zeppelin i was a little turned off by it just because i thought that it was a crowd pleaser you know like you said it they have a very toxic fan base you have a very 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 basic fan base that likes you know bon jovi and journey and we don't we don't like them here we really yeah, don't, we they're, really don't. They're, they're awful just they're, i have ptsd i, even thinking I about just it. thinking about it i the, and if you like them good for you for somehow finding pleasure in listening to them but we we just can't agree with you cringe like cringe like i I like i can see the 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 trailer trash as you said (laughs) the the the, the, i can smell the smoke in the air you know (laughs) but um listening to this album it was it was it was a good pick um again you explained it very well you explained yourself and i think i can see why you picked it especially since you were going for the influential um, you know, list. This is a very influencing album, especially as a debut. 
So I I I I don't have anything else to say about it. Well, everyone, let's look out for number six for Cameron's next pick. I have look out for number one by Brothers Johnson. Now, I, as I mentioned before, this has probably been my most ambitious year as a music listener. I have been going all over the place. And one of the places I went to very early on this year was the disco and funk era I was listening to everything I could. I was listening to One Way, Wild Cherry, you know, um, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Became a really big Sugar Hill Gang fan. And then I somehow found this album. I think I was actually listening to the Chili Peppers or watching like a documentary on them. And I had heard that one of one of the most iconic bassists of all time, Flea, um, quoted or, or, or said that, that Louie Johnson, Thunder Thumbs, was one of his most influential bassists. And so I looked him up and found this group, found this album, and immediately loved it. It is so groovy, it is so funky, but it also gets, like, very scenic and calm. I mean, it has, like, these, like, interlude tracks. Well, I wouldn't really say they're interlude, more like these, like, instrumental solos like where they just go off and they play their own thing and they add like this flute and it's very you know calm and peaceful and then you have like the other more aggressive tracks like get the funk out of my face and um their cover of come together that kind of make you want to like get up and do the little you know groovy you know the little psychedelic dance it you you get into it and um i know you you actually really enjoyed their their cover of come together didn't you? Um, you know what? I'm going to take the hot road here. Um, <laughs> their version of Come Together is better than the Beatles. I'll live by it. I, I, I'm not I'm not going another direction. It was so funny the first time I heard it. I was like, man, this this bass track sounds so much like the Come Together, you know, like, <laughs> and I was like, then he started saying it. I was like, man, these lyrics really sound like the lyrics were coming. <laughs> then yeah, I looked jokes at on the, us. <laughs> yeah, jokes <laughs> on us. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, at first, I, I don't know if I liked it or not, but I, I think I agree with you. I think that it is a better... I really liked it slowed down and more of a, like a, a groovy track. Um, but, you know, Louis Johnson, his brother, George Lightning Lakes Johnson, two really good guys. I think Louis Johnson just recently passed away, so rest in peace to Louis. But um, if you have not checked out this album, it's probably my most underrated album on my list. I know a lot of really hardcore, old-timey, funk fans know this album i actually found out it has a, a pretty big fan base um bigger than i thought it did and um if you haven't listened to this album definitely check it out yeah you kind of lost me flea like the insect the insect <laughs> <laughs> no um so for me i'm so glad that you showed me this honestly because I, I'm usually someone who's very informed and I at least would know the name Brothers Johnson, but never have I ever heard of them before Cameron came into my life. Um, I mean, how they aren't compared to the likes of the Funkadelics, the Commodores, Sly and the Family Stone, or even Earth, Wind & Fire is it's truly beyond me. Um, I'd say we start a grassroots movement to kind of get this band up and going, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm down with that. But with a band that's already, not even a band, sorry, a group that has, has made a huge name for itself, um, let's hear your number five pick. So my number five pick is Enter the 36 Chambers by Wu-Tang Clan. And before I kind of talk about them, there's another important thing I need to talk about. From now on, Cameron and I would like to be referred to as, this is my Wu-Tang generator name, by the way, Thunderous Lover and Cameron. The Ambient Ambassador. That's right. If you see us in public, call us the Thunderous Lover and Ambient Ambassador. <laughs> straight up. Um, I, <laughs> I don't even think you're really a true Wu-Tang fan. I, uh, Thunderous Lover. I bet you can't even name more than, like, three members. Um, Ice Cube, uh, <laughs> Easy e Dr. Dre. No, that's uh, N.W.A., bro. Oh, you mean HWA? HWA? Oh, yeah, that HWA. <laughs> no. Yeah, let's go ahead and do this Wu Tang uh, member call out. Quiz. Quiz. <laughs> the RZA, the Jizza, Method Man, Raekwon, Old Dirty Bad Person. Bad Person. <laughs> ODB. Uh, OD, yeah, OD, yeah, ODB. Um, who, who, who would be 
inspect a deck. There you go. The, um, that's Ghost face first. killer. There we go. Dude, I never he get inspected. Always forgets Ghost Always face forgets them. But I, so like I I don't I don't know if it was painfully obvious or not, but that was a, a little scripted. And I always I always throw that at him because I'm like, you're not a real Wu Tang fan. We'll get into this conversation about it. And he always forgets Ghostface Killer. He almost forgot him right here. And I swear that was not scripted or anything. He literally cannot remember <laughs> Ghostface Killer to save his life. Even though he's like the most iconic member next to like Method Man and ODB. I mean, he has a freaking eagle on his wrist and you can't remember Honestly, it. Honestly, <laughs> I'll take the argument that the Jizz is probably more iconic. Than really? It. Yeah, I don't probably. I don't know. I, I think you could argue any of them. Yeah, but this album is it's it's amazing. Um it is probably the like quintessential East Coast rap album, in my opinion. I mean you have amazing tracks on here such as Bring to Ruckus, Shame on a Homie, The Mystery of Chess Boxing, um, Method Man, Protect Your Neck, and although it is a little overrated, uh, and you hear it a lot, but Cream, it's a good song, uh just a little overhyped. C- kind of like what were we talking about earlier that was very like overhyped? Oh, jump. It's kind I wouldn't of like compare jump. it to jump though, because jump's it's better. way but, more. Yeah, yeah but, but, but cream is cream's better. Um, and it's what's really cool is they have these hardcore lyrics. Like this group has these hardcore lyrics, and they're introduced to us in this kung fu lee's language. I I crack up every time you say kung fu lee. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you don't know what he's talking about, he's talking about like the samples they took, like a you know like a. A, a clan you like, know, a, like, like a like a seven it's basically like 70s kung fu movies like they just kind of and it's really them. I, I really enjoy it like they really fit and uh it's it's a lot of fun to listen to it's a very interesting take um i was a really big west coast fan and i'll get a little bit more into this later because they're also on my list they're a little bit higher because you know i got love for the wu-tang but i was a big west coast fan <laughs> i was a big west coast fan <laughs> And this album alone converted me to East Coast. I didn't even I didn't even give Nas or Biggie a, a, a glance. I was like the Wu Tang all the way, you know. But uh, even though they both have amazing debuts that are equally two and three on the list. Oh yeah. If I were to, if I were East to rank Coast it, or just rap albums. Debuts. Well, probably both. Honestly, yeah. I mean, Enter the Thirty Six, Illmatic, um, Ready to Die. No, yeah, Ready to Die. Is that Biggie's debut? No, is, is that, that I'm trying to think. Ready to Die or. What is it? What is Biggie? Is, it's Ready to Die is definitely one of his albums. I don't know. If no, that's it's one of his albums, but I don't know if it's I, his debut. Is it Born to Die? Notorious B.I.G. But Wu Tang, really fun, and I, you can kind of say like they were all really. They had a, a really successful discography too. I know that you could probably say that this is a basic pick. Um, you know, I was criticizing Brandon for it, uh, his basic picks, but I think that you could argue that this is one too, but. You also also have to note like how influential this album is as a debut with the Wu Tang, you know. You know, you, you kind of make me mad, Cameron, because you give me those look like like you're definitely wrong, Brandon. I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, I I definitely listened to Ready to Die recently, and I was like, I think that's right. I mean, there's Ready to Die and Life After Death, but I but Ready to Die is definitely his debut. Okay, 3, my bad. I'm my bad. Yeah. So S T F U. I didn't want I didn't want you to mess up on on live air. Yeah, that is not live. <laughs> yeah, not even close to live air. <laughs> All right, so my number five pick is the Cars self-titled debut. The Cars that came out in 1976, which is just what I needed. <laughs> oh my god, we got dad jokes here. <laughs> I told you he's an old man over here. <laughs> the All Cars, right, let, let the good times roll. Come let on, camera. Th- <laughs> I didn't think that I was the biggest New Wave fan until I was trying to think of which debut I liked better. The Cars debut, self-titled, um, Men Without Hats, uh, Rhythm of Youth, or uh, um, Men at Work, self-titled debut. And Cars is definitely my my number one pick. Uh, just because I feel like New Wave as a genre kind of got a little, you know, overrated and just overplayed and and they too heavy on the synth and everything but the cars kind of started it off with uh this album they were very early with the, this um they were with the british the second wave of the british invasion and i think they really paved the way you know you the the start of the 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 genre i think was was pretty solid even though the rest of it wasn't as good but you have really good songs on here. You, as Brandon mentioned, you have Let the Good Times Roll, 
just what I needed, My Best Friend's Girl, Moving in Stereo, you know, all mixed up. There's a lot of really fun songs on here that are constantly played on the radio still, and I don't think they're overplayed, honestly. Like, for as much as they're played, I don't find them overplayed, I don't think, at least. I think I think that, kind of what Cameron just said, um, for the other Boston New, or, yeah, the Boston New Wave um, group, too, um, Boston, more than a feel, <laughs> yeah, they both come out of the uh, Boston New Wave, and I just, um, they're, they don't get old. Like they're like easily listened to, and yeah. sucks because a lot of people who do enjoy those two bands are again awful for for the most. Maybe not the Cars, yeah. but like Boston, like Boston fans are very yeah. particular. But yeah, I I agree. They're one of the best like new wave bands. They're one of the best like late seventies, early eighties groups. Um, I might for new wave, I might put Talking Heads over them but again it's very very close i well now that i'm thinking about it i completely for i always forget about the b-52s too i i absolutely love the b-52s and their their debut was classic rock lobster oh my goodness one of the it's a bop it's It's a a bop it's a it is the definition of a bop you can't spell bop without rock lobster (laughs) yes sir (laughs) all right let's hear your number four pick so we're we're leaving Grandpaville. We're, we've, <laughs> we're, that ship has sailed. If it hasn't sailed by Enter the Thirty Six Chambers, it will now. College dropout. Um, we already know who wrote this. I don't even need to say it. You don't even need to say anything else. College dropout is a number right, four. Cameron Garrett. Right, with so my number four. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's written by Jesus. Um, decipher that if you will. Um, <laughs> This album has a classic such as All Falls Down, Spaceship, Never Let Me Down, Slow Jams, The New Workout Plan, We Don't Care, Two Words, Jesus Walk, and Through the Wire, along with many, many creative skits that have been implemented into rap albums since Three Feet and Rising by De La Soul, another amazing debut. So obviously one of the most definitive songs on on this album is Through the Wire, which goes into how Kanye had his jaw wired for something like six weeks, six weeks, I don't know. Um, but in a way, you can implement Christian ideologies to this, as you could say that he got his mouth wired shut, so we, as the world, wouldn't have to. <laughs> um, it was recorded over four years with Rockefeller Records, uh, which was founded by um, the iconic Jay Z, uh, Damon Dash, and Kareem Bugs, and K- Kanye used them from College Dropout to My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. So. It's hard. Let's just say I had four babies, and I had to pick three to live. Uh, we have College Dropout, Late Registration, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, and Jesus is King. <laughs> we clearly know that My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy or College Dropout is a clear choice that has to go. Yeah, Jesus is King doesn't even come into question. You have to... You let know, it live. You have to let it live. <laughs> <laughs> um... I know how big of a Kanye fan you not to not to get into too much controversy quite yet or to turn off too many of our audience audience members but you said you think Kanye West is your favorite artist of all time is that is that true or false did that you is, not say that <laughs> yeah go ahead and give me the mic um that is indeed very true this dude is innovative like say what you will about his personality it's it's definitely unique to himself but just the way over the past 20 years, name another artist that's killed the game more than Kanye. And literally, even people on your on your list, like 100 Gex, almost guarantee they're inspired by something Kanye did. Or at least at least they showed love for the dude. <laughs> well, I mean, like, it, it's he's, he's going to be cited as one of the most influential artists, I think. Um, he really is ambitious. He really goes all over the place. And he's very well produced. His lyrics are extremely well written, um, and for as controversial of a figure as he is, he has a pretty solid discography. He keeps it, you know, at that. He sets the bar high immediately with this album. It's my personal favorite college, or Kanye West album, but uh, it didn't make my list. I show Kanye a little bit of love later on, but he set the bar so high. And he kept hitting that bar, I think, or going above it or below it, depending on who you ask. I think Kanye's fan base is like all over the place. And I think the the funny thing is, is I think you either love Kanye or you hate him. Like there's no in between. 
but there's no doubting his influence. Yeah, I, yeah. There's, there's definitely no doubting. I mean, I think the biggest reason so many people are turned off by him is because of how controversial he is outside of the, the recording studio. That's okay. We need it in society. We need it in society. <laughs> but um, if you yeah. want to go into your next uh, super surprising um, or um, pick for your list. I was going to say we could take just a a very quick small break, maybe. Very quick small break. Yeah. I I dig it. All right. We'll be right back. And as we said, we were going to leave off. And now we have – we kept you you waiting there. But uh, we're going to (laughs) go ahead and go with Cameron's number – You know, to us it felt like an eternity. It felt like an eternity. It might have just been a couple seconds. Exactly. (laughs) So if uh, you're ready, go ahead and say your next one. My very surprising number four pick – Right after your number five pick is 36 Chambers by the <gasps> Uh Not much to say that we haven't already said. Um, this album is is a lot of fun. Like we said, probably a basic pick, but we both really, really like this album. I really like Wu-Tang as a whole. I think their discography is pretty solid. I also think that, you know, like their individual um endeavors were were pretty pretty solid too i mean they had how many gold albums or platinum albums between the however many of them went out solo a lot they also covered so many different you know producers they they were all over the place um i don't remember who went where exactly but i know that they went to like def jams and uh what was the no you you helped me with this i don't remember (laughs) is it was it kanye's which one's kanye's rockefeller I don't, I, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know what individual groups they went to. I, I, I just know that they, they went all over the place, which was not really heard of, of, you know, like a group that could dominate it as a group and then everybody go out on their own. And they were everywhere. Like, I heard they had, like, a video game. They made, like jingles for like commercials like they, they were, were on dave they were on the dave Chappelle show they were on the dave Chappelle show i think rizza's like sponsoring chipotle now with his beats or something like crazy they are all over the place and i wouldn't say any of them necessarily really sold out i'd say rizza might be the closest one with chipotle but i wouldn't even say he necessarily did but um there was no ground that 36 or Wu Tang didn't cover. They were they they dominated the scene wherever they went, and um, they 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 did it with like like the creative skits that you know I think are are so fun. The like I don't know if you've ever gone to like YouTube and watched like people like recreate the skits like a visual of it. It's kind of funny to watch sometimes, like especially like the Lego ones. I know those get a lot, those are pretty popular, but um, yeah, they they're they're. they're they're a lot of fun to listen to. Yeah. Um, On to his, like, talking about how amazing all their solo work is. All their solo work's pretty solid. If I had to pick a singular one, though, Liquid Swords, the Jizza. That the is, Jizza. that's a cool album to listen to. It continues on that Kung Fu Louise language that we love so much. <laughs> that you love so much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Enough love for the 36 Chambers. Yeah, we talked about it way, way too long. Let's hear your number three pick. Is this it? The Strokes, two thousand one. So apparently, I really love New York, like bands. Like I really love the New York music scene. Um, but I don't know. I think this album is great, and the fact that it's got that really awesome two thousands rock alternative sound. Um, it's a very solid gateway. I, I, I think. I mean. This is a band most people probably know of, especially once they got into it. But I just think there's something so catchy and um, unique about the album. Um, I think Julie, Julian Casablancas is one of the most unique singers of the alternative rock scene uh, in the past 20 years. Uh, his solo album, uh, Phrases for the Young, is pretty solid. Uh, his work with The Void is pretty qu- catchy as well. I think there's a lot of comparisons between him and uh, Jack White. I honestly... I don't know. I might pick Julian over Jack White, which is that's a yeah, hot take. That that's is a, a hot take, take. but it, I don't know. They, be, they each have their uh, different things going for them. Um, and I don't know if, if you've ever seen the music videos to go along with them, but their music videos are just also just as catchy as like the like the songs that they're uh, creating. Uh, I think they they have good work after. Is this it? They have. Um, Room on Fire, Angles, and their uh, even newest album, New Abnormal. I think those are all very solid albums. But 
this is easily their most solid album, without a doubt. Um, you have songs such as Last Night, Someday, Barely Legal, Hard to Explain, Soma. Honestly, any of the songs of this album, you could like definitely get on board with. I cannot. I am not the biggest Strokes fan. I think uh, The Killers did it better. Uh that's, no, I, I don't actually think that. Yeah, I'm going to be... Um, it's obvious, kind of, though, that they that the killers were influenced by the Strokes. But I am not a big fan of them. I, I don't like their style. I, I don't think they're... But I can... At the same time, I think, like you said, they were influential. Um, they were kind of like the front runners of like the 2000s rock and alternative music. Like I said, they influenced groups like the killers. Um, and there's no denying that. They're just not for me. That's fair. Um, which is also kind of weird, though, because I, I would say that it's like a group that you either love or hate, but I don't know. I feel like it's like a, it's not really that type of group. It's either a group, it's mostly a group you just love. So I, I think you're just spitting unpopular opinions. <laughs> well, I mean. Which was going to be the original name of our podcast, but until interesting someone enough. Someone stole it. <laughs> until someone stole it a few years back until because until. apparently it would be a pretty common podcast name to so, use because it was a good one you know? yeah because it was a good one which we came up with they stole before three years later <laughs> <laughs> but um strokes i i haven't really i i listened to this album and i i don't know any of the, like their other albums off the top of my head i haven't really dove into their discography so i don't want to like say i i hate them necessarily this album just was not a good gateway for me into the strokes i i wasn't the biggest fan of it yeah this is coming from a dude who probably does like love the killers <laughs> no i don't yeah. that was, that yeah. was a okay joke. big yeah, big <laughs> big air quotes there best debut the, now you know what my number one pick is <laughs> yeah. nice job Brandon. <laughs> but yeah we're ready yes. for ready for your next one buddy my number three pick and i know you have some love for this number three pick as well is uh are You Experienced by Jimmy Boy Hendrix. And Taylor Swift. <laughs> and Taylor Swift. Jimmy Hendrix, rest in peace. Probably uh, your favorite member of the 27 Club, uh, as I know. Um, 1967. Let's paint it. Let's paint an image real quick. British Invasion. The Brits were everywhere. You know, there was no stopping this undeniable force. And then you have this iconic guitarist coming out on the stage with some purple haze oh my goodness there's nothing like it who is this man african-american man in this you know huge british you know invasion doing a doing a you know like like i don't i don't honestly know any front men that were african-american at the time i know that it wasn't the biggest group you know well i mean in the 60s <laughs> except everyone in motown really yeah. I, I i haven't explored motown yet i might have to do that he, cameron here is just ignorant to the uh, motown sound don't I, scratch whatever he just said there are a lot of front runners in uh, those oh, groups my bad my bad thank you for thank you for correcting me that's why i have you here you know brandon and i we we really play off one another you know we're not we can't be knowledgeable on everything so thank you you're welcome um, think, kind of think of kind of the image that he was painting, kind of think about it like this pre 1775, the British were everywhere and you know, America, we're like, we're not even our own little thing, but Jimi Hendrix is kind of like America breaking away and becoming their own like country in a way. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of like how you put it like that. Yeah. That's a good Because way yeah, literally the British were everywhere. I mean, I, I, most of the time you think about like the mid 60s you just think of all these like yeah, british bands like, i can name like you know like so many just like you know even like discluding the beatles the rolling stones you had the animals dave clark's five you know you had uh the I, were the no the romantics weren't big right then were they the romantics they weren't they weren't british were they i don't know why the romantics what yeah the romantics they're like an 80s band dude are they yeah bro who am i thinking of the monkeys monkeys were british then right david jones yeah david jones is a very like that's a very English name. I'm going to say... Uh, the, I think the Monkees were... I'm going to say the Monkees are probably a British I, band. I'm and I'm going to check sure. that really quick. So I also I think uh, the Zombies were also on that scene. Were they? Yeah, bombies, the Zombies were in like the psychedelic scene. Like, But they were British, weren't they? They are British. Yeah. So, I mean, like... Oh, shit. The Monkees are from L.A., so... Oof. What are we talking big about? Oof. Yeah, I big oof. We're I taking we're L's out to... here. Man, maybe it's not as easy to name all of them. Yeah. I'm really struggling right now, aren't I? <laughs> um... 
Anyways, Herman, the- Her- <laughs> Herman, Her- I'm I I'm choking. I'm even choking now. I was gonna say the hermit Herman hermits. The hermit hermits. <laughs> um, yeah, Jimmy Jimmy was uh the the one of the the leading. American- oh, the Yardbirds. The That's- Yardbirds. That, that that was another. I wasn't I I was about to say the Yardbirds, but I was scared I was gonna get it wrong again, so I didn't want to. Um, what was I saying about Jimmy? I don't know. We, we probably, went on so many tangents. Probably there. the most influential album on my list, if we're being honest. And it's only the only reason it's not higher is just because I think that I've had personal experiences with the. I'm not experienced with this one. You know, when Jimmy asks, "Are you experienced?" I'm not personally experienced, <laughs> even though you know, like it, it's a solid album. I mean, like you have Purple Haze, my personal favorite, Foxy Lady, Hey Joe. There's a lot of really good ones on here, and I know that you have this album on your list too so i don't want um, cameron that's wrong i actually just had an audible and i'm actually what i'm deciding to do is put dog poop on your front door and lighting it on fire just at the idea that you would even say such a thing what? me have the, are you experienced on my list <laughs> and after this you're crazy <laughs> oh my bad my bad also um, one last side note i will make there isn't a cool member of the 27 club respect the dead bro <laughs> Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, Brian Jones, the drummer of the Be- or of the Rolling Stones. Don't Come say on. it. Don't say Come it. On. I'm not saying it. I, the I'm not British say- van we forgot to mention. The Doors. Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison is not. They are not British. Bro. What am I thinking? Jim Morrison's British. Three thousand twenty percent not true. Bro, they are bro. definitely out of LA. I did ass thought definitely- the Doors were British too. No. Oh my god, dude! I'm- why are you taking such a big shit right now? I don't know. <laughs> or big crap right? I mean. <laughs> You're taking, like, the biggest crap of all time. The doors are definitely out of America. Bro, I, I don't know what's going on right now. Yeah, Jim I, Morrison. You're right. Jim Morrison is yeah, a part of Los 30 Angeles. Cent- yeah, I know. Man, I thought that they were British, too. Maybe there were more American bands than I thought then because they were pretty big, weren't they, in the 60s? I mean, the British were still huge. I mean, right now, we're talking about very, like, late 60s. But, like, that early period, it was definitely mostly ran by, like, British bands. The Two of the biggest being the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Well, I was going to say Homies with Attitude and Taylor Swift. Oh, my bad. Yeah. They were in her the, band. They were the, the front runners. Yeah. Yeah, no, but the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were definitely the biggest of the air. There's no if, ands, or buts are denying. Well, the, 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 you know, as a debut, this is, you know, this would make a list. This would make top 10 most influential albums without just being debuts. This is right. an amazing album. So. So Let's next, get off this topic, please, yes. before I make any more mistakes. Yeah, so we're actually going to another American band of uh, the 1960s that are very influential, and we're going with the Velvet Underground with their album, The Velvet Underground in Nico, which came out in 1967. It's probably the most avant-garde album on my list. Um, obviously, the Velvet Underground is led by Lou Reed, who, as we know, is someone I have deep admiration for, especially as a solo artist especially with some of his albums like Transformer, Berlin, Coney Island, New York. The dude is just amazing. Uh, then we have John Cale, who is um, the violinist of the group, who kind of brought the avant-garde sound while Lou Reed was bringing the very like rock type of sound. Um, Sterling Morrison, um, pretty solid electric, electric guitarist. Uh, Maureen Tucker, um, pretty solid drummer. And Nico, the disturbingly haunted German singer. Um, very beautiful voice though. Uh, she really contributes a lot to this album. Uh, some of the top tracks from, I think my favorite track, it's probably Femme Fatale. I just think it has kind of a cool little flair to it, but Heroin is also up there. And honestly, I know Ohio is, um, very, it's Heroinville. <laughs> as, as, <laughs> Whoa, we're getting deep. <laughs> we're getting deep. Ohio is Heroinville, but I honestly don't understand why people would do heroin because they could just listen to the song and get the same effect, which I'm sure is not an ignorant statement at all. And <laughs> yeah, ouch. <laughs> um, then you have Venus and Furs, I'm Waiting for My Man, Sunday Morning, which is the most pop song on this album, um, All Tomorrow's Parties. I, there's just so many great songs on this album, and that is probably why it's one of the just... It's on a lot of greatest albums of all times lists, such as Rolling Stone, Time Magazine, Q Magazine, Pitchfork, and I'm sure a million and three musicians have it on their list as their best album because this inspired a generation of people to just go in their garage and just make rock music, really. Um, and Andy Warhol, 
um, minor name that you've probably never heard of. Um, the famous artist who was involved with the project, uh, he acts as the producer uh, in the sense that he paid for the studio sessions and marketed them as his own, but he wasn't really a part of the producing per se, but he still very much led the way and he provided the iconic banana that is their album cover uh, that you could easily peel on and off if you have the vinyl, which is very rare. Um, I might prefer Loaded on a very personal preference, but I think this is probably the much better album and the one worthy of praise. I, for as a, as a influential and as popular as they they were, I uh, I didn't really know much about them. I think I heard the name before, but and I've heard Heroin before, but I never listened to this album or even thought to listen to them. And after listening to this album, I'm still not the biggest fan. Um, while I don't actively dislike this album like I do with The Strokes, um, I, I don't think it was for me. I think that uh, Lou Reed was better solo, which might be a normie pick, maybe. It depended on, I think that, that that's a pretty popular pick, do you think? You know, you no one so. knows who the Velvet Underground is. I, was I mean, say, there's very, there's like a select few people. Like you know who it is, but like you don't really, really know. I think so. That's, that's okay. Fair. We'll let it slide. We'll let it slide. But um, yeah, I, I don't actively hate this album. I, it's easy to see the influence. Um, it, it was in a way ahead of its time. I think uh, coming out in 1967, like we said, that was a really big. You know, there are a lot of really big name in that in that time period um so it's not hard to see why this band may be overlooked uh because it there's a giant shadow casted over it with you know the the pillars of the 60s but uh once you once you were explaining it and i did a little bit more research it's it's a lot easier to see how it influenced artists yeah honestly don't even feel bad about that because i think to me um the album for me is patty smith's horses I personally, I can respect it for its avant-garde feel, but that album is just so hard to listen to. I mean, it is just like not my cup of tea. So I understand this is very, you, you're either going to love this album or you're going to hate it. It's, there's no, it's like the Kanye argument. Yeah. There's no if, and, or buts. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I don't even think it's like as avant-garde as, as Patti Smith's is. I, I think this album's a little bit easier to listen to. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying with that. All right. Are we on my number two pick then? Dude, of course we are. Okay. Well, to bring it back, I have License to Ill by the Beastie Boys. Um, you know, we already really said everything um, about this album. It was, you know, the first hip-hop album to reach number one on the Billboard 200. And it was kind of interesting to see, like I, like I mentioned before, they were gaining traction as a punk band, but they kind of like just completely were like, no, we don't want to do this anymore. And I actually found out that they had a, a girl drummer when they were a punk band. I don't remember her name. I didn't write it down. I should have. But they, they ended up dropping her and adding Ad Rock. Ad Rock was actually the last member to join. And I thought that he was like one of the, you know, like the man that founded it. Like I, I constantly see Ad Rock as the leader, but you you said you think MCA is the more I think MCA is probably the more iconic one. Yeah, um, it's hard. It's kind of hard to pick. Like it's again, it's like picking which son or daughter to kill. That's fair. Well, I don't think. No offense, Mike D, but I don't think Mike D is anyone's favorite. I think it's always Ad Rock or MCA. Oh yeah, three thousand percent. <laughs> There's no argument. We we love you, Mike D. We love Michael you, Mike Diamond D. or Mike Diamond or whatever his name is. Um, but. I thought that was pretty interesting, and you know, they kind of came into a market that was initially against them, you know, hip-hop was predominantly, you know, African-American, a lot of people, you know, and all the, the wider audience was looking more for that rock sound, we're in the 80s, so Aerosmith, Guns N' Roses, ACDC, you have those very hard rock sounds that everybody was looking for, um, so they were not what people were expecting. So when they first came onto the scene, they uh, they were not taken seriously uh, by either audience. And then they started doing tours with Run DMC, Madonna, and people loved them immediately. And then they dropped this album and everybody went crazy and they never slowed down. Beastie Boys had a pretty solid discography their entire you know run until unfortunately Adam Young passed away mca passed away rest in peace rest in peace mca but um 
it's 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 also interesting to like compare this album to like later on albums like Paul's Boutique, completely different again. You know, they were with Def Jam's on this album, pretty much helped make Def Jam's as big as it was. Yeah, Rick Rubin is nothing without uh, BC Boys. Maybe that that might be a hot take, but he's definitely not as. Well, I would I I wouldn't say I don't think that's too hot of a take. I think that that's a a pretty solid, um, but. Then they went to Paul's Boutique. They completely left Def Jam's and went to Paul's Boutique, which is a completely different sound. It's, you know, we'll get into that, you know, later. Next episode. Maybe. Next episode. Maybe. We're not, not throwing spoilers. Spoiler. Yeah, not, <laughs> not throwing spoilers. But um, Beastie Boys, probably my favorite rap group of all time. I mean, you you might think Wu-Tang was after, after we gave them so much love, but Beastie Boys are definitely my favorite group of all time. I mean, I've already said everything I basically want to say, but I will add one more thing that just came to my mind. In a way, these folk killed two genres, like our boy William Shakespeare did back in the day when he was whipping out both plays and sonic or sonnets. Um, you know, the BC Boys were whipping out hip hop and rock better than anyone. Better than anyone. Yeah. No, they the boys entering anarchistic states toward internal excellence. Man, Beastie rep- represent. Wow, I'm glad you know what that whole thing means. Mike D, that's why no one's your favorite, because you you made a stupid (laughs) anagram. Is that what that's called? When each letter is a word, that's an anagram, right? That's not an acronym. Acronyms, when you rearrange, it is an anagram. Yeah. Okay, our producer's saying it's an anagram right now, so we're good. Whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) I'm not trying to sound stupid. No, anagram is when you rearrange the letters. Acronym is when... They each mean something. Oh, okay. My bad. I, I mixed them up then. You know, it's pretty early on right now. We've been talking for a little while. We have been talking for a little while. How about we take a, another short little break before we get into our number short one Short little pick. break before we get into our number one pick. Never right. do anything better. <laughs> we'll be right back. Unfortunately, uh, I wish I could talk about debut albums all day, but we're at number one. And I was just kidding when I told Cameron that I was going to put dog poop on his front door and set on fire because are you experienced by the Jimi Hendrix experience? Probably without a doubt the greatest debut album of all time. Um, I, there's not really a big argument for me either because it's just like it is a killer, killer, killer album to listen to. And Jimi Hendrix easily wins my award for the GOAT of guitarist, you know? Uh, Mitch Mitchell is a kick-ass drummer and Noel Redding is a brilliant bassist. Um, so comparable to having one of the best trios in music history, they have the best trio of albums with a perfect lineup, which include, um, Electric Ladyland and, um, Axis Bold is Love, which I'm not saying anything, but you may or may not see later on in our other list, especially (laughs) Axis Bold is Love on our uh, next list. Um, but yeah, Purple Haze, probably the best song introduction of all all the songs um, on my list, uh, I think Good bad, or good Times, Bad Times from Led Zeppelin would be two. Purple Haze, Easily Without Doubt, number one. Uh, the Wind Cries Mary, Fire, Foxy Lady. There's just a million and three good songs on here that it's hard to pick one. Um, I And then I actually have this as number one because I do think it is the best of his three uh, st- studio albums. And I think kind of like... Uh, television's uh, Marky Moon. This is up there as one of the, if not the greatest guitar album of all time. Yeah. Um, that was a lot cleaner than my my uh, listing of this, this album. Um, I think that the biggest reason why I went with like my personal favorites is because if we would have both done Influential, I think that our albums would have been a lot more similar, uh, especially with this listing as number one. It, like I said before, you don't even have to put the word debut in front of album, and it's still, you know, the mo- one of the most influential albums. You could argue it's the most influential album, I think. Um, at least top three I, of all time. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 I agree wholeheartedly. You know, Jimi Hendrix killed it, and Mitch Mitchell and Noel, Red- Noel Redding. I mean, it was it was an it was an awesome trio, you know. They're like the Beastie Boys trio, like the Beastie Boys trio, just like Nirvana rockier. trio. Yeah, the Nirvana trio. There's they're, so they're, many they're, trios. So, there actually really is a lot of trios. Like, like Primus was a trio. Uh, 
the Dixie Chicks were a trio. No, they were a duo, weren't they? I think that's three. Oh, they were three? Yeah. But um, there's not... Trios are great and all, but duos are even better. And that's why Cameron and I are one of the best. One of the best. Do you know what another really good duo is? My number one pick. You know, I'm going to show uh, my boy Kanye West some love with uh, the Kids See Ghost self-titled debut. 2018, Kanye West teams up with Kid Cudi, or Cudi the Kid, a lot of his friends like to call him. This album, absolutely amazing. I fell in love with it the first time I heard it. Um, it's a very short album. I think there's only like six or seven songs on it, and each song's only like three or four minutes. Like, it's a very short album. But it's a really impactful album, I think. Uh, um, Feel the Love, one of my favorite opening tracks, I think. Um, I think that it's so kind of iconic in a way because Kanye doesn't even rap on this track. He just makes like gun noises and in a way it, it's kind of like catchy to, to sing along with Kanye, even though he's not really singing, but you got, you know, the Cuddy montage, which uses a, uh, a Kurt Cobain sample, which I thought was really interesting to, um, let uh, Cuddy, Cuddy goes into like talking about his own personal demons and like his, how he's overcoming it, which is, you know, in a way symbolic using a Kurt Cobain track or a sample, I think. You have uh, my personal favorite song, Fourth Dimension. Uh, you got Reborn. I, I think that this album's just, you know, another one of the, the masterpiece Kanye West can put his name on. And uh, I, I really like the duo. And I really hope they, they, they do another album together because I think that they did really good together. Yeah, I think this is one of the better albums of the past few years uh, from things that I've heard. I think it, they, they do make a great duo, and I really love how n music nowadays, they're more to the punch. Like, you don't have these, like, hour-long, like, albums where you, like, and not saying they're all the time bad. They're not. They're, some of them are really good, but, like, sometimes it just becomes a dread just staying, like, in one place or listening to one thing for an hour. But the, these these folk could be doing it in under 30 and doing just as good as some of the other albums that have just a bunch of fillers in it. Um, yeah, I, as I said, Reborn. Reborn's probably my favorite on the track, but again, there's not necessarily a bad track on this album. And yes, Kanye can put it as one of his masterpieces. Oh, you agree? I, when I first tried to, when I first presented this as um, one of my favorite debut albums, I hadn't even listed it yet. Brandon was over here yelling at me because he said that it's not a debut album, which I think it could be argued either way because, I mean, both of these artists had their own personal debuts already. They, they're they known artists, and then they collaborated together and made this group. Well, Cameron, as I told you, like, but this is them as a new group. I mean, this no, is like... this, this is, is like, what I told you. <laughs> this is I, like this is like Eric Clapton joining um, Derek and the Dominoes. I mean, Layla could easily be considered the debut album of... of um, Derek and the Domino, so or why can't... Audio Slave, Chris Cornell joining, you know, Tom Morello and the rest of the band, you know, I that, that was my argument, don't don't let him steal his credit, he was pretty sold on the fact that this was not a debut, do not listen to him, but um, solid pick, I think, um, it might be a little weird to put it as my, my number one pick, a lot of people might be a little surprised by that, but as a debut album, I, as one, as the, I would probably put it as probably, maybe not my number one pick, but it would be in the top five picks of the last decade, I think, of, of albums of the last decade. Um, but yeah. Well, solid. You, you, Cameron, you had a very solid list. I think I had a solid list as well. Maybe my list might be better than yours because you're Depending work list. Depending on who you ask. Probably, that's why we brought it here to the, the table, just to, so we could debate on it. You know? Exactly. But hey, uh, we are glad to have you guys um, listening to our new uh, podcast, Fighting the Envelope. And I think for a debut episode, this was a very solid start to our careers. This is the Kid See Ghost or the Are You Experienced of our <laughs> careers. Uh, but we know from here, the current only gets smoother. Um, so check out our best sophomore albums to die for in the near future. And everyone, have a great rest of your day.